thank you everybody for coming today. Um, it's exciting to see all of you. Um, today, it's um, it's not just one-sided presentation. I actually do not like to present. I'm most of the time I'm doing engineering, so as a prison as a presenter, probably I will not be at the top of your list. Um, I like conversation, like to ask questions, and hopefully you guys can jump in and respond. You know, feel free. Um, hopefully it will work for you and for everybody else. Um, it, the, also, the presentation is kind of like gradually building up on itself. Um, I'll get to more current technology and more exciting technology closer to the end. Um, and uh, if you want to prepare an answer for if you want to discuss directly with myself on the spot, uh, what is your competitive edge? This is my question to everyone. What is your competitive edge? Regardless if you have services or technology, whatever you build, whatever you do in life, you have competitive edge. So what is it? Um, okay, I'll just start the presentation and then we'll figure out so what I'm talking about. What is competitive edge? Um, we'll start from this point, from the beginning. So competitive edge, mm, something that you must have and you must protect. Your future, as your company's future, depends on it. The theory behind it um, um, is an old theory, but um, it's uh, there is a wonderful book by uh, Hamilton Helmer. It's called The Seven Powers. Um, and over there, he defines uh, different competitive edge, and he gives a lot of examples with large corporations and how it all works. Um, but the basic, kind of like stating in English, simplifying things, it's a set of conditions creating the potential for persistent differential returns. Persistent, long-term, not short-term, like forever if you maintain it. And um, let's start to get some, some examples. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Um, um, let's start from a well-known example about competitive edge and the loss of it at one point. And the question is what went wrong? You know, feel free to jump in, raise your hands, or um, I'm not sure how this kind of like meetup works. Um, I don't know if you raise your hand and Miguel tells you, hey, please talk or however it is. I think so. we're small enough to allow, let's try that, Shmuel. We're small enough to allow for people to just chime in and, and say they have a question or a comment. Let's uh, with let's pleasure. It that way. Let's yeah. do it. So what went wrong with Kodak? I mean, this, this, this company was practically printing money and sometimes in the 2000s, they vanished. What happened? They didn't innovate with the times? Well, Kodak at the time of vanishing had 65,000 patents. Five patents, 5,000 patents were just on digital photography. So if anybody jumps in and say, you know, they didn't understand digital or, some, or did not own the digital technology, that's not the, that's not the right answer. So the, Kodak so thought that their there. competitive edge was printing pictures. But um, that really wasn't their competitive edge. They didn't have one. So the world changed, regardless of them owning the technology. And this is, I think, this uh, this was Walt, yes? Because I don't see images here, so I'm just, okay. Well, um, that's absolutely true. So the problem here was business, not technology. The technology changed, and the business could not keep up. Kodak built huge amount of uh, invested large amount in facilities to print technology. To print Can I make a comment on this, please? Yes. Uh, I worked for Xerox because of VPN Xerox. What yes. Kodak did wrong was the same thing that Xerox did wrong with their star workstations. I mean, we were the preview of Apple and stuff. It was purely management. Management didn't listen to the engineers. Management didn't uh, the MBAs, they thought that this was a financial company. It didn't work. And um, as we've seen in other companies, they lost track of really, they lost the mission what that company was about. And that's why it went down. I hear you. And, and, I, feel for, and I feel it. And I've seen it before. And um, I'm not disputing what you're saying. It's definitely part of the game. Um, management did not realize early enough 
that they are investing in technology that is going to go away very soon, like just around the corners. And they continue to invest in that technology. And therefore, it was a financial issue. And at that point, they could not, um, you know, get the money back from their facilities because those facilities were not useful for anybody else at that point, And they've lost the company. But in terms of technology, they did have the right technology. They just didn't leverage it. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. Guys, I don't know, some of you are too young to remember. <laughs> it was before you were born, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, some of the first computers I worked on, you know, after, you know, after high school, um, were this computer, this IBM PC. We with had, the floppies. With floppies and the DOS operating system and, um, and you know, CPM and all sort of other things that were on this, which, which were fantastic. The keyboard was extremely solid. I mean, you could hammer, hammer things with it. I mean, um, the computer was solid. You know, it was hard to get problems with the computer. Um, the entire design was good. IBM invested a lot to create it. Um, but something went wrong. There is no IBM PC today. Why? Hardware became a commodity. Marketing? And you think because marketing? I, I can look at it from a, a technical perspective. They thought that they had a lock on the hardware architecture and Phoenix came around and broke that lock. Wow. And suddenly the floodgates open and the, it was a rush to the bottom for, from a pricing model. IBM is a high-end marketing company. Machines are secondary. It just, their business model requires them to charge a lot of money and the margins just weren't there. On the hardware? Yeah. So, um, you know, IBM in the early days, um, <clears throat> intelligent business machines provided both the hardware and the software. And they did one step wrong on these small systems. They thought that these systems, the operating system is not that important. What was important for them was the hardware. That's true. And the hardware ROI changed very rapidly. So they went out, uh, they went out of this market because they couldn't make money on it. While the ROI on the software continued to increase. So now we have Microsoft, a trillion dollar company, and IBM still struggling wherever they are. They're doing well, but I'm, they're not in that the same business. Okay, let's go to the next one. So again, this was um, a company that used both software and hardware as competitive edge and gave one away and then lost the race. It by the way, the uh, Shmuel, I'm just keeping track also of some of the commentary that's coming through the chat room. And Sean Murphy, hi, Sean, makes a good point that Cisco had the same problem, right? Their business model is predicated on on the hardware margins. And in fact, I was at HP for 12 years. I saw the same thing there as well, right? And and and, and that that's that's a recipe for disaster down the down the road. It could be. Um could be. C Cisco is in a different place um relative um relative to the opportunity, relative to the market. Um in, in this case though it was it was degrading rapidly. Um um, there's there are other things happening with Cisco, but um, I'm, I don't think Cisco is in such a bad condition relative to where what happened to IBM uh, IBM PC. It degraded within four years. It's like it was gone. Uh, can I do a counter argument on IBM PC? Yes, sir. Like Xerox, bet Xerox and Kodak bet all placed all their bets on one product, or one class of products. IBM spread its bets and it survived the PC disaster. It did. It did. IBM is extremely innovative um, and they are in multiple business. 
Um, so they, they actually survived. They did not fail because the PC failed. They thought the PC is just a small business. So it was all strategy and, and uh, even within it, they took something that they had before as a competitive edge and slice and dice it and end up with only part of it, which was not good enough. Everybody knows Netflix. So how did Netflix rise to power? Who did they, you remember who they dis displaced in the market very quickly? Blockbuster. 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 So what was it? Was it was it a technology play or a business play? Business. It was a business play, not technology. Even though later Netflix had to adapt their technology to streaming and they did it very well. Um, they uh, the first play, the first the biggest play that they did was actually a business play, not technology, that has to do with competitive edge. They look at their number one competitor, which was Blockbuster, and says, how does Blockbuster make money? And it happens that 40% of Blockbuster business came from late returns. Netflix said, we'll create a business that is profitable with no late returns. Guess what happened to Blockbuster? They could not erase 40% of the revenue and they went out of business. So I've been working Motorola as director of advanced technology and strategy for 20 years. So I kind of like now um, what's going on. And have you guys seen all this uh, police guy and others, you know, using the Motorola technology? Now, what's interesting about this technology, it's a wireless technology. It's standard. Yes, anyone can sell into this market. And Nokia and everybody else have tried and failed. Not because we own the patents in Motorola, because it was standard, so not necessarily it. It's all about the competitive edge. So what is or what specifically was Motorola's competitive edge, if anybody knows? And by the way, still is in the market. And I'll give you a, an idea. It's, it's not really technology. But they uh, use technology. Telephone? The phone itself? No. I have to tell you that the, um, the phones or the mobiles being, sell, being sold in this public safety market, the margins are huge margins. Extremely high. For a reason. So I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in because it's kind of like, oh no, I, 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 I was inside, so I know what's going on. Um, the entire idea with the system is that uh, in public safety, I don't know if you guys know, but the most expensive thing in a system is the antenna. You need to locate it. You need to pay for the space, usually on top of you know, whatever it is that you, have, that you own as a real estate. And then you have a very tall antenna. Those antennas are about $5 million a piece. So if you are, let's say, the city of San Jose, and you have X number of antennas in your city that cover and give you uh, access to your technology or to this push to talk te technology, and somebody else comes and run tests, and let's say Nokia comes and say, hey, let me give you a much cheaper mobile set, handset. Uh, Motorola sell it for $8,000, ours is $800. Why don't you buy from us? And of course, let's test it. So when we run tests, we find that the mobile from Nokia does not work really well in that environment. It actually, there are areas that we can't do push to talk and we can't communicate, which is a public safety hazard. So we can't take it. But what Motorola did say, although it's standard, we are going to develop the hardware with a little bit higher sensitivity on the receive, which reduces the number of antennas that you need in an area. So if I can reduce the number of antennas by one, I saved you $5 million. But so you as a customer would love that. You'll buy something that saves you money. 
but it locks you into Motorola because everybody else is, their mobiles do not have the receive sensitivity and therefore you can't buy the equipment, the infrastructure from Motorola and buying the mobile handset from somebody else. I don't know how it is today, but it, there was one point of time Motorola was over 80% of the push to talk market in the US. And all by playing this strategy, which was a very good strategy. Um, so let's go to technologies of today. I mean, push talk still exists, but let's say you have a startup and you have a brilliant idea. You're going to make a drone and you want to compete in a drone market. Can you guys tell me kind of like ideas with regard to what could be a competitive edge in a drone market relative to everybody else who's building drones? Give it to the Ukrainian army. No, I know this drone looks like an army on it, but it's, it's just a picture of a drone, you know. Not an army, it's not military, it's... It doesn't have any laser on it. Savina just wrote in the chat uh, box, uh, Shmuel, yes. the, the the time in the air, the their Perfect. ability to stay afloat. Eureka, time in the air, okay? So one competitive edge when you build a drone would be how much time can you be in the air, on the, in the air um, relative to your size? speed of flight, and it all ends up with what's your weight. So if you can create technology that reduces the weight without increase the cost, you have a competitive edge and then you would like to have IP around it to maintain it for as long as you can. Well, the reason it's there, it's one of my clients, not the military one. But that's that's the strategy. This is what we are doing together. So isn't that the standard any flight equation, which is the energy, uh, weight, payload, distance, speed, all those. Any airplane has those requirements, right? So they you have do. to. They do, but but it's it's in airplanes. We know the technology and we know how to play. It has to do with wingspan and other things that we can play with. In the drone. Um, we want to have it as small as possible and still as effective as possible. So we are we can't have a drone with you know a twenty or thirty feet wingspan um, in in a residential area uh, and so forth. So we want you know the drone to be as small as possible and yet um, have um, 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 fly for long distances, stay in the air for long, be able to lift as much as possible because we want to transfer things, et cetera. So there are all sorts of competing requirements. And what happens with drones like this, it's all about what you put inside of it, not just the outside. So it's not like um, material design where you say, oh, I've got a material that the drone itself is still strong, but um, but it's very light on material. Everybody has this material. I mean, most startups are not material startups in the Bay Area. Um, it will be it will be on technology. Um, can I reduce what it has inside so it's extremely light and still deliver on what it requires? That's on drones. And that's the next one that I thought was would be fun. And I've kind of like wanted to ask you people to think about. So we've got Google today. And, you know, at least I hear the talk um, talks about that, you know, they're struggling. They need to bring their new AI search to work and to work well and to be able to compete. Um, what does that mean? I mean, is Google in trouble right now? Do we think that Google will not exist a few years from now? And if so, can if you had a company with tons of money, I don't know, X millions of dollars right now, a startup, can you create something? Do you have an, an idea that you can create something where Google become the blockbuster of the world and you become Netflix? 
what is that we can bring, maybe in potential, to compete with Google? And feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, and speak up, guys. Don't 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 be shy. <laughs> Bring ideas. I mean, and you know, if you think you have a really, really good idea, don't tell us and just go do it. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, if you want to check, you know, with your friends here, we all friends, just put it on the table. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, just a few days ago, uh, I was discussing a program with a coworker, and I said, I have, I don't really write much code anymore, uh, but I want to write it. And then one of my other coworkers said, use ChatGPT because Generally, when you write code, you actually use Google. You can't write code nowadays without Google. And then I went to ChatGPT. It wrote a, wrote a beautiful program for me. And then I said, can you program this with taking into consideration race condition and synchronization issues? And again, it did a good job. So suddenly, Google becomes super fierce. For that problem, okay, I'm still in shock about it because for the last 20 years, 15 years or so, I've been writing code using Google as my search engine. I yep. look up, look up the APIs. I look up this. I look up that. I look at sample. Yep. You and, and everyone if, else. And if I have to look at any hardware design or anything, Google it is. If I have to look at a security issue, it's Google. That's my area. Okay. And suddenly, ChatGPT beat me to beat that by orders of magnitude. It also beats every search you can do on Google by orders mm -hmm. of magnitude. And also, as you work with ChatGPT, did you did you get a feel that you're working with a person? Or, or it was more conversational, yes? You ask it to do something, it does it, and then you ask something else. You ask it to improve on things, yes? I felt like I was talking to the people who invented Linux. So uh, Unix. Unix, yeah. okay. Um, Rich Cunningham, I, Cunningham and Richie, I was talking Cunningham to those Rich, guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, they were programming at that level. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you showing Shmuel? I didn't see it. I put on my glasses. Oh. It's the C oh, programmer. Yeah. C. Yeah. <laughs> by the by, these guys. Yeah, the guys yeah. who wrote the operating system. They wrote those books as well. I mean, so these were my first books for Unix and Linux, and my first uh, Unix, not not Linux. My first Unix system that I worked with was in 1983, and this was my the material at the time, which is. Phenomenal. Um, yeah, I learned operating system on that on that system. Mm -hmm. Really good. So, so, so we're going back, and and I'm asking. So you end up, and and this is what I wanted to get. Raj, your answer was fantastic. It gives us a hint of what's going on here, or where I'm going with that. So I have an idea. Maybe I'm completely wrong. I'd love to share it with you for a second, which is. Our experience, and I work a lot right now, and um, uh, I actually develop a lot of IP for some of my clients on and around language modeling, ACA, GPT, Relative, and other, and other AI models. Um, I'm, I'm looking at that, and I notice when I started to work with GPT that I say thank you. And I'm like, oh my God, I just said thank you to a computer. I say, thank you. And I say, can you please, you know, I actually type, can you please do this or search this? Or what do you think about the following? You know, it's it's like, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm talking to a person. And at that point, what dawned on me was, what is this person is lying to? And then I started to compare it to search. So when I go and do search, you know, I kind of like know that Google is going to pop up things that I don't really need just because they want to sell them to me or they want to get <laughs> in certain places. I expect it. I actually, when I go to Amazon, 
no matter, I mean, I'm looking for Legos for my kids. I mean, I've got two babies They are, you know, and, and my five and a half year old uh, uh, boy, we, we, I, I say, I say, I want Lego and I, and I click, give me just Lego. I don't want any Chinese stuff, anything that I can't build, anything that doesn't come with a good manual, anything I can't trust. They, they continue to push all this stuff to me that, that I don't want to see. And I expect it. Okay. But with ChatGTP and with this conversational kind of like relationship, I expect more, and I think I expect more is because our instinct as human beings, our emotional, um, conversational way, and looking at somebody, and we, we process it a little bit different. So if a person, let's say, if I had asked ChatGTP to bring me just Legos, and he'd bring me something else, I would close it and walk away. I wouldn't use it anymore. I'm done. Game over. Um, with with Google, I expect it. Okay, with that one, <laughs> but with ChatGTP, because we've developed relationship. I mean, I said thank you to you. I called you by your name. You okay? I know who is your family. I know who is your daddy. I mean, there's some relationship here. We've built some rapport. You chat chat uh, chat GPT will also apologize to you. Exactly. You can say no, no, no. Would you, you know? I I asked for this, and they'll say, oh, oh, no, I, I'm so sorry. And they think, exactly. oh, <laughs> hello. Exactly. So, 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 I'm starting to think about the Google business model. Two things: pay for visibility and pay per click. So if I have ChatGTP and Google behind it and suddenly it starts to lie to me because it brings me things that I don't need, I should go to someplace else that I get what I need without being lied to. Because now I can also express my wishes much better than just type it in general. I'm looking for shoes. No, I can tell it what I want and I can even use emotions. It can even listen to me and understand. So if you build a search engine or something on overlay on the search engine that uses ChatGTP or some other language model language, uh, language model um, that would not allow or would not benefit or receive payments from pay to play and you know click or pay per click. I'm I'm willing to pay you five or six dollars a month just to use your system, maybe even more. Stop selling me, stop do advertisement. Give me what I need. I can over time you're gonna learn what I really like and what I really buy. I may just walk by you by the computer and say, hey, I need I need my I need my run, new running shoes. Can you find me something? And I will trust that you'll find something that I probably gonna like. So these are my thoughts for today, basically kind of like to share with all of you. I understand Google's, where the money is with Google. And I think there we are in a world right now, we have a window of opportunity to compete and take it away from them. This is really, really insightful. And it's uh, scary, like, uh... 2001 Space Odyssey, hell, right? But it's also very exciting. I know, Sean, you had a question. You raised your hand. I, so I had, two, I, had, I had two observations. I think I think what what I was trying to suggest was, and you're suggesting is, hit them where they aren't. And exactly. so a subscription a subscription model is antithetical to the pay-per-click and the selling ads. The other place that they've traditionally been weak that I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity is on the intranet side. And I think this is even going to be a problem for chat GTP as currently structured, which is I might want chat GTP to, uh, to review all of my contracts or all of my whatever that I don't necessarily want to go back into a public domain repository or in the case that Rajesh talked about, I'd like it to look over my code base, but I don't want that to leak back into the public domain. You, you can do that. You can do that. All right. So this is doable. The problem. So the thing is, um, I, I are we talking about technically or business model wise? Oh, business model wise, you can do that and you can create the business for it and you can actually utilize because, you know, ChatGDP need to do the training. So you have to do the training outside in the internet. 
but you come back into the intranet by adding um, by adding context. So you can add context and there are ways to do that. And we can talk about if, if you want to offline and, and get into it. But in general, you can also build business on providing context around chat GTP, okay? And by doing that, enabling intranet in a, in, in a correct way. Yes, I want to review contracts, but I can't train him on my contracts because my, I, I mean, how many contracts do you have? 10,000, 100,000? Yeah, the guys I'm talking to do. Millions yeah. of contracts before he talks to you. No, okay? but, but that doesn't matter. Those don't matter. If I'm, if I'm licensing software, I don't give a crap about real estate leases or auto leases or 90% of the contracts out there. I completely agree with you, but from language modeling, it needs to train itself. The way train itself is, he doesn't know, he wants to understand different contexts and you can ask it about the context. What I'm saying is let it train in the world, come back and work only for you. So you pay for that work. So you can definitely create a business model where you, you provide this SaaS or service, which behind it, part of it is GTP, but you get the services from OpenAI and it's, you pay for those services, and what you get is never. So once once you push your queries to OpenAI, it's not clear that there's not leakage to me. That's once you once you give anything to Microsoft, Google, or any of the top five, three, five, ten, twenty, fifty, <laughs> five hundred out there, you cannot trust it. So you can now go and build your own, which you can. Because these models are about seven years old, by the way. Um, you can actually get this done if you want to. You can get from open source to your development, you can develop that, figure out access through back channels or open channels to large variety of data to train it and start to sell those services in a trusted environment where you come front and say, you license with me, it's internal, all trusted. Um, and secure, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's a business model to go and compete. I mean, I, I'm cheering for you. Please do it. I'm going to pay for it. I want it. <laughs> I think there is already market for it in Europe where there are actually GDPR requirements, literally requirements that prevent you, the data processor, from taking the data and using it without your consent. They just can't. Legally, you can't. Um, I mean, it's just. Um, uh, yet again, if that data uh, data processor is is Google, um, even worse. I mean, I, I know some people are going to kill me. Um, um, so when was it last year? Apple shows up. Uh, the CEO says, uh, "Yeah, we're actually using all your data." I mean, it doesn't go outside of the company, but in fact. When you sign up the phone, when you get a phone and you sign all these documents to get the phone, we own your data on the phone. Anything you put on your phone is ours. We'll, we'll keep it safe, we promise you. So when, when these corporations are, we'll keep it safe or it's not gonna be personal, but we'll just do statistic on it. So if we wanna go into the privacy world, it's a completely different presentation. I'm ready, but not today. <laughs> I, I've got it actually ready because I'm 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 one of those serious privacy advocates, and I spend a lot of time on it, and and I run a non for profit just on that subject um, with other people. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, the GDPR forces uh, companies to honor right to delete. I know that because I worked on the RNA and uh, uh, some medical devices coming out of Europe, and mm -hmm. uh, anybody can say. I want all my delete data deleted, and you have to. Yeah, but and and GDPR does that, and at the same time, is what GDPR did not solve is how do I know that it's you who asked to delete the data? Yeah, that's yeah. How, how do I know? Yeah, that you have to build, how, and that how, how how do I identify you in my system because. I'm, I'm, I mean, you are playing on my Google search and I collect the data on you, but I don't really know who you are. So if you want to identify yourself in order for me to delete your data, and I do not know, I mean, anyone can go and delete your data now from the system. Yeah, you have to build the controls in your system in order to do it. You can't do it backwards. 
That means you have to design it right from the beginning that GDPR is going to be required. It costs a lot of money to build controls, and I don't think that Google is is going to go no. spend all this money. So here's another competitive advantage for you, if you yep. want. So um, it's a fun conversation. I want to continue that. I just want to go to the next slide, which is as a question to everybody. Think about whatever you are doing right now, whatever the company or the startup that you work on. First, think about it. And then if you want to share or ask questions about it or share with me, I mean, I used to have a radio show just on that subject, by the way, an hour every week. I spent time, but I stopped that because I had some personal things that I had to go do last year um, and I didn't restart it. Um, it was in Clubhouse. But what, you know, what is your competitive edge? What are the set of conditions that you are leveraging that give you this potential for persistent differential returns? And I do not know what's your business. You can just share, you know. Um, Miguel will tell you. Um, yeah, talk and we can talk. 